I'm just going to walk through a little bit about our company, our farming operation, kind of when it was started, what what we're kind of up to, and and uh, and race through just some of the opportunities that uh, we see on the farm. Here we started in '74. This is my father who recently passed away, but I would just say one thing that's kind of unique about this. I'm standing here with uh, one of my sons, my my dad. When my dad started in '74, if you just look at a crop like tomatoes, he was budgeting 22 ton per acre furrow irrigating, and uh, he was using more water, producing less tons. And in his day, he was considered to be a, a pretty progressive grower and what have you. My generation, you know, today we're averaging about 60 tons under drip irrigation, making fewer passes, producing, you know, more with less. Briefly, we have about uh, 25,000 acres around the Huron area, all of which my family, we own. This is the same ground that these generations continue to improve um, uh, yield and lower costs and what have you. Uh, we also were involved in uh, tomato and almond processing. Los Gatos will run about a million tons there. Harris Wolf, we're currently handling about 80 million pounds of almonds. And we're investing in, you know, kind of the best available technology on the farm and these uh, operations to drive costs and efficiency. Next. Uh, one thing about our company and our management team, we think it's really strategic to be kind of early adopters on technology. And so we're very oriented to figuring out, you know, this is a great time to be a farmer with all these startups and with, with the, the work that's being done, like the work you guys are doing. And so, you know, we still operate in this very optimistic, uh, uh, lots of opportunity kind of mindset. But again, we think it's strategic to be on the front end of the adoption curve. Next. Um, and, and again, we've just basically switched from going from row crop operations, growing a lot of lower value uh, commodity crops like grains, melons, cotton, and what have you, where we did a lot of groundwork, a lot of land leveling to uh, basically the adoption of all of our property now is under um, either berry drip irrigation, micro sprinklers, what have you. And then we shifted our crop, crop profiles to crops where we enjoyed, you know, better returns per acre foot and where California had strategic advantage. Lastly, I would just say the adoption of drip by itself, uh, we dramatically reduced the number of passes in our fields. We drove productivity. So early on, when we first started today's session, and we were setting goals or heard goals of like saving 50% energy and water and what have you. I think it's key from my mindset, like, uh, you know, you have the right metrics. We likely won't be able to make those savings per acre, but my goal is to make the savings per pound or per ton, meaning we're gonna be driving yields with fewer inputs. Uh, next. Uh, so far uh, from my Again, my dad starting in 74, um, you know, we're producing three times the number of tons per acre on the same land. Uh, we vertically integrated. So we drove, uh, prior to us building our own facility, we were trucking tomatoes up to Tracy and Stockton and what have you. And now it's a, a much shorter haul and we're saving over a million gallons of diesel per year. You know, I think these are just things that a lot of people kind of forget like, wow, there have been these achievements. Um, and we've reduced our, our diesel burn out in our fields using, again, the berry drip. And just uh, one thing, when we built our, our tomato facility in 1990, there were no um, uh, emission standards for our boilers. Uh, today, we have to operate at about 5% of what those boilers, what we were allowed to emit back in 1990. Uh, it's a pretty impressive uh, tracker here, track record, I believe. Next. So our challenges right now with drip uh, by concentrating the water and having to rely more on our wells or concentrating the salts uh, where when my father was farming, he was distributing the salts evenly through his fields. Now we just put them right in the seed row. Um, distribution uniformity with all these drip systems 
uh, it's amazing how many people, how many farmers put in a drip system and assume that they have uniform distribution uni uniformity throughout that field over the life of the system. And uh, we all know that that changes and you have to constantly monitor them and what have you. Um, you know, I'm one that thinks there's still opportunities to get more out of our crops, whether it's CRISPR or actually crossbreeding stuff and using genetically mod modified organisms, what have you. Um, you know, we still think there are opportunities there. Uh, labor costs are going up, our availability is tough, and you know, water materials regulations. Uh, opportunities, again, keep in mind, I'm looking at this from a vertically integrated farming and food processing perspective. Imagery in our processing plants, I think there's great opportunities there. And a lot of the data that we're able to look down on our fields, um, FW stands for fixed swings, just getting um, imagery of our fields, figuring out where the stress is and what have you. And one area that uh, I think we, there's great opportunity that we haven't quite nailed down is with yield monitors. Like in our tomato fields, you know, as I mentioned, we're averaging 60 ton to the acre, yet we know in those fields, they can vary from 80 to 40 tons in any given field. I want to have yield maps, uh, and this is tough to do in the tomato business, that would overlay with uh, our, our maps that are showing stress in the fields. All of our soils are very, very uniform out there. So anyway, I think there's opportunities there. Uh, more analytics, clearly. Um, I, I talked to Olivier in the past about we have an irrigation business that puts in irrigation systems and drills wells. I think one of the opportunities is for companies that basically sell plastic pipe to actually be selling water use efficiency to their customers and provide, you know, put the sensors in, provide a, a framework where they, they're delivering a service that ensures that system is really functionally efficiently and they have good distribution uniformity. Um, again, we're gonna continue to invest in mechanization and in, in, in regards to the materials we're using, we're, we're using more biologicals um, instead of just synthetic uh, fertilizers and what have you. Next. Um, one thing that I just think is kind of interesting, you know, we are inundated with people with great ideas that, that not all of them have ever been on a farm or, or you know, where there are these great ideas, but uh, that don't have kind of the practical experience of how to actually get them used on the farm. And, and so we're swamped with all these choices. It's difficult for our team to figure out, you know, who do we align with and who do we work with? And, uh, you know, most farmers, okay, we're swamped. Um, we tend to have a lot of assets, uh, not necessarily a lot of cash. Uh, I think that generally makes farmers a little skeptical about where they're going to invest their next dollar when it comes to new technology. Um, a lot of snake oil salesmen out there. And I think most guys do feel a little bit like guinea pigs. Um, and I think a lot of the people that bring technology to us, you know, they're, they're clearly, a lot of them are focused on their product and how they go to market and how they raise their next round. Uh, typically, we, we run into a lot of people that seem kind of stressed, overworked, strapped for fun, um, you know, and uh, are usually overly optimistic about the impact their technology can have. And it's, it's just kind of a funny dance that I point out if you're a farmer with all these folks coming to you with great ideas and you're known to be an early adopter or interested, it's still a tough thing to figure out who to go with. Next. On our team, so how we do this, I actually get our team together, all my farm managers. Uh, I ask them where they think, what technologies, what areas could we really move the needle most on the farm? In an area that's water deficient, you would think all of them would turn to water. Most of them do not. They think we can move the needle uh, with just better analytics. And when I say not with water, just like 
when I ask them, do you think we can move the needle from if we're already in the low 90s or mid 90s and water use efficiency on the ranch, do you think we can get you know higher than that? Uh, these guys tend to want to think about you know we just need better information systems, um, you know, uh, you know yield monitors uh, that kind of thing, but. We allow them to kind of dictate where, where are the areas and the technologies that interest you the most. We allow them to go out and talk to the, to the people approaching us and make recommendations. And then we reward them uh, when they make the right choices. We share uh, some of the savings with them. And I always tell them, if you guys perpetually are picking the wrong vendors and the wrong technology, you know, then we'll have to make other decisions. But so far, they're, they're pretty good about, you know, dialing that in. But I think it's part of our culture. It's part of our DNA to be early adopters. Next. Um, this, uh, you know, just as it relates to like nut processing, we just spent about six and a half million dollars on the latest and greatest in electronics. And, and uh, what's really startling to me is how good this equipment is and how we're able to run right now about 40,000 pounds an hour. And once it goes through a bank of these high-end electronics and goes through the sizer, the product is basically market ready. And I, I point to this a little bit because one thing that occurs to me as we go out and develop key relationships with buyers, I think the buyers are getting more and more focused on the type of technology and the equipment we're using. And if you have a choice to buy from a hundred different processors of almonds in the state, why not align with those that have the best equipment to really deliver the highest quality and what have you. And, and I look at it, this is an instance where technology is driving consolidation. To put in a six and a half million dollar line, you've got to have the volume to actually you know, make the economics work. And then once you have it, um, we look at it that we're probably one of maybe five to 10 processors that, that can actually do this. So we think this will uh, make us more attractive to larger customers, but ultimately it is leading to some level of consolidation. Next. Uh, here, the technology just in, again, in in sorting and what have you is getting so much better an issue for us in the almond trade. Clearly are things like aflatoxin and, and uh, salmonella and what have you. And if we can do a better job figuring out how to sort this stuff out or detect it, uh, it makes a huge, huge difference. And so we're watching improvements here and very excited about it. Next. Um, in California, just being a farmer here, you know, I not to go into this great depth, but you know, we're we really have kind of lost a lot of our surface water. Sigma is going to reduce our acreage down further. Um, you know, we do have issues with trade and what have you. Our our labor sources are fewer and more expensive. Even things like truckers trying to find truckers during harvest season is becoming more and more difficult. And clearly, energy is one of our ever you know, growing issues and problems and cost categories and regulatory issues. Uh, next. So, you know, a lot of these opportunities and, and things that we see, you know, we still need to have the policies in the state that allow us actually to end up with like our optimal outcomes. You know, we were talking about groundwater recharge. Groundwater recharge right now is not considered a beneficial use in the state. And what that means is if you're a federal water contractor, you have to demonstrate beneficial use really to keep your contract and be eligible to receive water. Surprisingly, in a state that really does need to do more groundwater banking, we haven't changed the definition of that. And there's some uncertainty as to whether or not, um, you know, it's, a, it's an accepted use of surface water in regions of the state that are, that are uh, either federal or state districts. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have a statewide plan for flood flows when they arrive. Um, 
you know, and we do need additional infrastructure if we hope to move this resource around throughout the valley. And uh, water banking and, and water marketing all sounds great, but you still have to deliver it. Um, we need funding on ag research and, and at our public universities. Uh, solar, we, we think long-term solar is gonna be part of our crop mix. And we hope to generate some energy, use it uh, on site and use the water that's associated with that land uh, elsewhere on the lands that we are farming. As it stands right now, uh, it's not considered an ag use and it does put in to jeopardy uh, our water rights. Uh, it sounds crazy, but that's kind of where we are. Um, next. Uh, we do a lot of long-term planning here. We're hoping to pass this on to the next generation. Uh, kind of our crystal ball, we think with technology and with regulation, all these challenges, there's gonna be fewer farmers. The bigger are gonna get bigger. Uh, we're gonna have fewer acres in the valley. Uh, we think it will, with Sigma, we'll see 500,000 to a million acres come out. Um, we think this will push more permanent crops as crazy as that sounds and the hardening of water demand, when you look at your return per acre foot, we're better off fallowing ground and using those water supplies to grow maybe fewer acres, but make them you know, more uh, profitable crops like almonds, pistachios, wine grapes, citrus. Uh, certainly fewer dairies, uh, we'll have higher farm revenue, uh, but we think our, our margins will continue to be squeezed um, I really think the, the big opportunity is to, for us on the farm, we continue to focus on improving yield while marginally reducing our inputs. And that's what will drive, we believe, you know, the right metric that we, well, we believe is the right metric. It's the water per ton or the water per pound or the energy per, per ton or pound. Um, we're also, uh, for the next generation, we're doing this now. I'll be in Portugal in about a month. We're looking at opportunities outside of California. We see a lot of the crop shifting, permanent crops in particular, from the south to the north. Uh, we're not getting the chilling hours that we used to um, in the south. And uh, in our own case, we're really focusing on more renewable energy as part of our mix. Just yesterday, I got a 1600 acre uh, solar installation approved for our property. And uh, we're gonna be leasing that out for about 30 years and utilizing the water on that on our other crops and hopefully be able to tag in for our own use on uh, our farm. Next. The crazy ideas I think about now, um, you know, really, my dad used to focus on all the lands that he was irrigating. I'm probably spending a little more time focusing on the lands that uh, we'll be fallowing. We're presently fallowing about 7,000 acres a year. I mentioned the solar. We're also uh, looking at some water banking uh, on our property. We'd like to be in a position that we could store water for other growers and provide it to them in uh, dry years. We're looking at, this is my secret plan, I'll share with this group, I'm looking at agave uh, to plant on ground that we'll be following. And uh, I, in particular, like well-aged tequila, and I don't know why we don't have it here. So anyway, we're, we're actually futzing around with that. We're going to continue to mechanize. Um, I would hope one day with uh, opportunities with solar, I would love to have a microgrid where all of our vehicles on the ranch you know, are uh, electric. Um, I think in our future, we'll likely, I hope, uh, you know, see uh, more electric farm equipment. The other thing I think about is we generate a lot of biomass, but uh, we have po policies in the state that they really don't want to see burning in the valley. But I think, you know, if we could burn it cleanly uh, using pyrolysis and, and figure out a way to actually utilize some of that on the ranch, I would love to be preheating water going into my boilers at the tomato plant using the trees that I'm taking out and rotating and what have you. Um, and again, I mentioned the need for yield maps and greater water use efficiency and how that will, will help drive yields. One more. 
Um, just how we look at it, we don't think we're going to see the run-up in farm productivity that my father saw, like from his generation to mine. I think we're going to continue to push the curve uh, the uh, up top, but uh, I don't think it's going to be as great. Um, uh, most of the high tech, this is what I always tell our team, you know, most of these guys that are bringing these great innovative things to us probably won't make it. We've got to make sure that we choose the ones that we think will not only have good technology, but we'll make it. Um, we're going to get by. We're going to we're going to be using less water, uh, fewer materials, less labor, you know, but it's going to be really incremental. I would point out like uh, this is one thing I tell our guys. We save an inch of water on the ranch. You know, it's worth about 250 grand to us. And so can't you save an inch? And so anyway, um, these incremental changes are still meaningful. Um, I think innovation, as I said, will, will drive consolidation. Um, we're getting much more uh, transparent with our key customers and providing, you know, having the information and systems in place, what have you to provide that I think is, is meaningful to them. But the more information we generate, I also recognize ultimately government may very well use this to further regulate us. Um, food quality safe and safety, we believe will improve. Um, I continue to think that we're going to have to embrace technology to improve yields and varieties. I would just make note, like in our tomato business, if we can move solids, sugar solids and tomatoes from averaging 5.2 to 5.3, that one tenth uh, is worth about six pounds of paste on a raw ton of tomatoes. And it doesn't sound like a lot unless you run a million tons. So that would generate 6 million. That, that's worth about another two and a half million dollars to us on the revenue side. Um, and so I, I look forward to seeing uh, better varieties that are producing higher yields, producing more finished products. And I think that's how we drive the savings in energy and uh, water.